Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be able to speak to you. Um, I also want to um, thank you very much for the uh, warm um, in, uh, welcome that uh, we have received here. Um, I, I'm really privileged to uh, come and travel here and be able to share with you uh, the work that we're doing at the University of Michigan uh, to uh, address the shortage of uh, pacemakers uh, around the world. Um, we um, pretty much understand that um, low and uh, middle income countries have a lot of challenges with communicable diseases. But um, as a matter of fact, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer uh, of people worldwide whether it's in the advanced economies or uh, the third world. Overwhelming majority of deaths due to cardiovascular disease uh, do occur in the low and middle income countries. And it is estimated that about a million people in the world die each year because they don't have access to pacemaker therapy. This graph shows uh, the comparison and the gaping disparity between um, the uh, advanced economies uh, represented here by the United States and the low and middle income countries. The uh, uh, number of implants that we perform in, in the United States is about 750 implants of pacemakers per one million uh, of the population. This compares to merely several per million in some other countries. So there have been several um, um, organizations that have tried to address this uh, uh, problem. And one of them is Heartbeat International, which in the last uh, 20 years has been able to procure um, 12,000 devices from device manufacturers um, and uh, offer them to different rotary, uh, rotary clubs uh, around the world for uh, use for indigent patients who have no access to pacemaker therapy because of the costs. And of course, there are medical missions in which physicians uh, harvest devices from, um, uh, during uh, device upgrades from pacemakers to defibrillators, for example, or after a device infection, and they re-sterilize the devices and they send them uh, to, uh, on medical missions. What we um, uh, are trying to address at the University of Michigan is to find a uh, a blueprint or create a blueprint for reuse of pacemakers uh, harvested from uh, uh, the deceased. Um, in the United States, there are over 250,000 pacemakers implanted uh, each year. Um, the vast majority of patients who, uh, or, or a significant portion of patients who uh, receive pacemakers are elderly and their life expectancy is actually limited. And uh, given that the longevity of devices nowadays is um, sometimes 10 or 12 years. Uh, it is um, uh, quite possible to harvest devices with uh, sufficient battery life so that they can be re-sterilized re and reused uh, in the third world countries. This concept is actually not novel. It was tried uh, in Europe and uh, different other countries. In Sweden, for example, in the early 1990s, 14% of total primary implantations were actually from refurbished devices. Uh, but as the prices of uh, pacemakers fell and um, uh, the uh, European Union, um, uh, Sweden joined the European Union, that practice uh, w went by the wayside. So what we've done was we've actually started by doing a meta-analysis on uh, studies performed in the last 30 years on this um, uh, topic, and we have identified 18 studies uh, which examine the safety and uh, efficacy of pacemaker reuse. Um, and we um, uh, actually f found a variety of studies. Uh, most of them have several patients, some of them uh, a few dozen patients. Uh, these studies were done in a variety of countries. Actually, one of them is Israel. There's a study by Dr. Cooperman from 1984, uh, which described the experience of uh, uh, reimplantations of 78 pacemakers in uh, patients. Uh, and of course, uh, when we compared the, um, the risk of infection between the brand new devices and the, and the controls, which were brand new devices, 
we found that there was no statistically, statistically difference uh, in uh, infectious risk. The risk of mechanical malfunction, as you would anticipate, was uh, much higher with reuse devices. However, we're starting here with a group of uh, phenomena that are very infrequent. So, you know, pacemaker malfunction of a brand new pacemaker is really a, a quite unique uh, and unusual occurrence. And so even a six-fold increase in, the, in that risk still appears to be uh, quite acceptable if the alternative is not being able to have a pacemaker at all. So what we did is we performed uh, uh, a survey of both uh, patients and their families uh, uh, at the University of Michigan uh, just to see if this concept was something that would appeal to the general public. And overwhelmingly, both patients uh, and their families were in support of the concept of donating the devices post-mortem uh, to patients uh, in the low and middle income countries. Um, and uh, a large portion of them also um, were uh, happy to offer the devices back to the device manufacturers, which is what currently is encouraged by the, uh, by the device manufacturers and by the FDA for um, quality improvement. And then uh, a minority of patients were also willing to donate uh, their devices uh, to uh, veterinarians for implantation in uh, animals like dogs or uh, uh, horses. So we also performed the survey of the funeral homes in the vicinity of Ann Arbor and we found that uh, patients or the deceased who um, uh, undergo cremation actually have to have their devices taken out um, uh, because it is damaging to the uh, crematory equipment. Um, and so uh, in, in this particular survey, um, um, the 10 percent of devices were extracted prior to burial, and um, um, the device was extracted prior to cremation, 35 percent of those deceased. And so we asked the funeral directors what they did with the pacemakers, and the vast majority of them discarded them uh, without uh, or, or kept them with no intended purpose and only 4% of them did what they actually are encouraged to do, which is return the devices to the manufacturers. So over the, uh, over the last um, uh, three years, we have actually received over uh, 10,000 devices. 15% um, of them uh, are of adequate battery life, which we define as um, at least four years of battery life remaining. Uh, these numbers on this graph actually are, come from a paper that we published uh, um, a year ago. Um, at this point, um, we had performed an analysis and, and we were trying to quantify the number of pacemakers that we were receiving that actually had the four years of battery life left on them. And for pacemakers, that number was 15%. It was a little bit higher for defibrillators because they, they have batteries that are uh, uh, larger and by, by ventricular ICDs, one out of three biventricular ICDs that we receive actually have at least four years of battery life left in them. Um, of the devices with adequate battery life, average time from initial implantation was um, about two years. Um, and so to summarize, the, uh, the, the meta-analysis of the prior studies supports the concept of pacemaker reuse. Uh, we have verified that the general public and patients and funeral home directors support the concept. Um, and we also know that one out of five devices that we get, um, it's, which is a combination of pacemakers and defibrillators, has at least 75% of the original body life left or four years left. So what we envision is a partnership uh, between the funeral homes, uh, between legal teams, uh, a funeral home, uh, a funeral uh, director association, and centers of excellence like University of Michigan or others um, who would um, engage in a process of reclaiming devices, uh, evaluation of the devices, and re-sterilization, and then passing them on to uh, nonprofit charitable organizations, which would then identify centers in the low and middle income countries uh, where these devices would be suitable. And of course, all of this has to be done 
with the uh, oversight of the Food and Drug Administration. Um, we are currently at the point of planning a prospective clinical trial on 400 patients um, across the world, um, and we are negotiating with the FDA about getting an export certificate uh, uh, to allow us the clinical trial. And so our hope is that we can create a blueprint for device acquisition, sterilization, and reimplantation. We will continue to raise public awareness and scale up the model so that we can have a self-sustaining nonprofit organization that will allow patient, uh, patients with no access to pacemaker therapy currently to receive this uh, treatment. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, collaborators that I've worked with and Dr. Tamir Bauman, who actually was one of my fellows who has come up with this brilliant idea, and I have sort of taken over uh, managing uh, this project after he left, and I certainly work with a lot of uh, uh, collaborators who, um, uh, without whom this really wouldn't be possible. And so I'm, um, thank you for your attention.